It's no secret that if you're going to be successful in real estate investing, you have to be able to fund your deals. Whether you're doing the Burr method or whether you're fixing and flipping properties for a profit, you got to be able to get to the closing table with money and you got to have money to rehab the property. And so I personally use backflip capital when I need money to get to the closing table and to rehab my properties. I'm in the middle of a flip right now and I partner with backflip. It has been the smoothest process of all time. I literally went on their app, applied for the loan. You get pre-approved in less than 48 hours. You can lock in funding in just a few seconds with the touch of a button. Funding takes less than two weeks. Hello, that gives you an advantage when you're making offers on properties. And I can't say enough about partnering with Backflip Capital. They're great folks with a fantastic product that everybody listening to this should check out for the next time you go to do a Burr deal or fix and flip property. So here's what I want you to do. Go down to the show notes of this show. I've put a link for Backflip Capital in those notes. All you have to do is click the link so that you can download their app and get your next deal funded with Backflip. All right. I'm here with Chad Carson. Chad, what's up, man? It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I am so excited. We were talking before the show. Uh, you live not far from me in the upstate of South Carolina and you played football at the greatest, the greatest football right. school of all time, Clemson University. We're a little biased, aren't we? We, we both we both like that. We we like Clemson, so yes, I, I, I did play football there, and it was a little bit before the glory days. We didn't we didn't win any national championships when I was there, but I had a good time. I love love Clemson. That's pretty awesome. I saw a picture of you. It's on your website. Like you played linebacker, did you not? Yeah, middle linebacker, right in the thick of things. Like you wouldn't. I'm a little skinny guy now, but you know, like I had the big neck and big shoulders, and was the, had the, had the beard. So just to kind of like try to intimidate people. But yeah, I'm a, I'm just a little softy now. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people know you. And so a lot of people listening to this will probably know who you are. If you don't know who uh, Chad Carson is, he's, he's known as probably more so Coach Carson in the real estate world. Uh, that's a great brand you've built for yourself. But I'm actually looking at the picture right now on your website. You guys got to go see him. He's yoked up. I mean, his <laughs> traps are just like, you know, massive. His neck is three times bigger than it looks right now on, on podcasts. It's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. A lot, a lot of a lot of protein shakes, a lot of working out, and that is said. Let's let's just put that energy into real estate. Let's go do something <laughs> different after. <laughs> hey, that that is smart. So you you got in pretty quick. You played college ball from ninety eight to two thousand one, but then I think what two years later, one year later, you dove all in to real estate. So take us on that journey of how did you know so quick that this is what you wanted to do as soon as you came out of college. Yeah, it was sort of like a temporary thing, to be honest. Like I was a pre-med major, so like I always liked biology, played football, but I honestly just needed a break. Like I'd just been going, going, going football. It's like a it's like a full-time job. And I was thinking I could make the NFL. That didn't really work out. So I just sort of had that like kind of aftershock from that. Like, all right, I've just been pushing it. I'm just going to take a break. I'm not going to go to school anymore. And the, the uh, fortunate thing for me is my dad growing up had rental properties. And so he's in Noonan, Georgia, outside of Atlanta. And so I just asked them if I could, I was going to move back at home because I didn't have any money yet. And I was, I said, could I just go out and find you deals? I went, I went to a little class and heard about something called a bird dog that we use down South, you know, where you just go point something out and say, Hey, that's what I want to, uh, I don't know what, what to do with that bird. I don't know what to do with that real estate deal, but maybe you could buy it. And then, so I, I went out, I was just, uh, you know, just hustle, just use my energy. And I didn't really know what I was doing. I learned how to analyze deals a little bit, but I would just go point to deals. He would buy them. And during that first year when I was living at home, I bought 12 properties that, well, I found 12 properties. He bought them. I made a little bit of money. I learned. And that's what really kind of got, I got the bug from that. I was like, all right, I don't think I'm going to go do anything else. This is pretty cool. And so I moved back up to Clemson. I have a business partner that we've been business partners now for 21 years. And we just started doing, I took what I learned in that first year, kind of being a bird dog. And we went out and started finding deals, initially flipping them, but eventually we started buying rental properties. And that's, that's what I'm more into now is to buy and hold rentals and live off the income and travel the world and kind of use this. It's, uh, it's been a good, a good journey. Wow. That's an amazing story. Yeah. And you, you do travel the world. You're what in Spain right now, right? You're not even in the States. Yeah. So we, we, we've traveled here and there, but this year we have two young kids there in sixth grade and fourth grade. And my wife's a Spanish teacher. So kind of our thing is that we like to go abroad and not just like travel around from here to there and kind of with the backpacks, which we've done that too, but we like to just stop in one spot, live there. Our kids are going to school here. 
Uh, they speak, they're speaking Spanish in school and learning Spanish. I'm taking Spanish classes as well, trying to improve my Spanish. And so it's sort of a, you could call it a mini retirement, a sabbatical, uh, just a pause, you know, press pause on life. And uh, that's what I've really enjoyed about rental property investing and real estate is that you can kind of control your flow. You can control the seasons of your, your work. And so this is one of those, all right, let's just take a break seasons and see how things go and work on creative projects and do different stuff. But yeah, we're, we're in uh, Granada, Spain, and we'll be here for 12 months and then we'll go back to the, to the upstate, back to Clemson after that. Wow. That's awesome. That's what real estate affords you. People, it's hard to understand the power of it until you actually take the plunge and you start reaping the benefits and seeing it compound over time. You have all of these dreams and I feel like so often our dreams feel unreachable. And so it, it paralyzes folks. It, oh, this can never be accomplished. So I'm just not going to do anything. Yeah. Whereas if you decide what you want, well, then we put a plan together and go attack it. And there's a lot of different avenues to be able to do it. But one great one that's proven itself time and time again, and that's why I talk about it on podcast every week, is real estate. And you cross that line in the sand all those years ago. And now you look and your life has completely changed and you wake up every day. And it's not like you're a slob because you're retired. People think, well, what am I going to do if I retire? That's not the point. The point is being able to wake up and choose what you want to do. And you've been doing yeah. it for a long time now. Yeah. I think choice is the key word for me. Like, and that was the reason I really, you know, I thought about going to med school. I thought about working for corporations and you know, everybody's got to do what they have to do to feed their family, to pay the bills. So like, I don't judge any of that, but for me, I said, as soon as I can get out of that, where other people are making choices for me, even the little stuff, like making me go to a meeting, that's just a waste of time. Like, I just don't want to have to do that, you know? And, if, and so have, it's, it's not that you don't have obligations. It's not that you don't have commitments, but the more financial freedom you have, the more you get to set the schedule for your life and you can set your priorities and say, all right, these things matter to me. These things don't matter to me. And I'm going to say no to those things that I have choices that I don't have to do. I can say yes to the things that I really want to do. And that doesn't mean you're sitting on a beach drinking a pina colada, which you can do. That's cool too. It just means that you can start saying, all right, what do I, what do I want to do when I grow up? Like those questions you kind of dared to ask when you were 16, 17, 18, 19, but then you sort of pushed them down because they're not realistic. They're not practical anymore. But the, every little bit you get, you know, you don't have to get it all, all at once, but every little bit of freedom you get, every little, even just having a savings account with 10,000 bucks in it. And you're saying, all right, I've got a little bit more autonomy. I got a little bit more choice. And you get one rental property and you get a few hundred bucks a month. And then you get five rental properties. Like every time that happens, you're just sort of moving up that mountain where you have a little bit more choice, a little bit more, a few more options. Uh, and that's the cool thing is like, you know, what you want to do, what I want to do, everything's a little different once you get up that mountain, but you know, you get to express who you really are, who you want to be. You get to serve people in a different way. Like I'm all about thinking about now, like, who can I help? Like, who can I serve? Because now I have this flexibility. And so for me, teaching is like a real calling. Like I really enjoy teaching. I enjoy writing and I enjoy bringing other people along with us like you're doing as well. So, you know, it's just, it's just a fun venture adventure to do it's not easy like there's a lot of challenges along the way like climbing any mountain but man it's it's worth it like it's worth the getting out of that slog getting out of that grind because that's not what we're meant to do you know we're meant to have more options more freedom to to do to do those things that matter there is a pot of gold at the end of this real estate ring <laughs> you just I have to so. get there. and there yeah. is it, it is a journey along the way like any any journey to a great destination you can watch any movie you know, where people are on a journey, think of Lord of the Rings, there's ups and downs, ups and downs. But if you stay the course, you learn a lot, number one, on the journey. That's where most of the wealth, you know, and knowledge is built. Um, but but then you can accomplish what you set out to accomplish. Uh, you said something earlier that I think is a good starting point for most people trying to invest. I, I believe people get caught up anytime they're trying to learn something new. They want to know all the technical details. They want to know everything about whatever they're trying to learn. I think people do that with real estate and it really locks them up. But one thing that you did that I think is one of the most important things that anybody starting out in real estate can do is you did what we call down South bird dogging, AKA you learned how to find deals. And I've said it over and over again, if in real estate you can find deals, like just put everything aside for a second and teach yourself how to find deals, you can have a future in real estate because 
that is the bread and butter because once you lock it up, now we can choose what we want to do with it. There's a lot of different directions. You can go flip, wholesale, keep them as rentals. Um, but I think that's important that you said, hey, dude, I was just going out and finding deals and analyzing properties, finding deals, analyzing properties. And I'm sure you got better and better and better at it. So what's a good method or a couple methods that you've learned? As, and maybe you can take us back to when you first started to that helped you dial in on finding properties, what types of properties that you specifically look for and how you've had success doing that. Yeah, deal finding is the, the number one thing. It's the skill that that really trumps all the other ones for sure. And I'll, I'll actually share, this is a simple strategy. People might've heard of it, but it's the it's one of the first ones I learned. It's one of the first ones I did when I, because I didn't have any money to go out and do anything with it. And it's the one, it's, if I had no other strategy I would do, this is the one I would continue doing. Maybe there's two of them I'll give you, but this one is, is driving for dollars. Um, walking for dollars, you can do that as well. You can bike for dollars. You can push your kids strollers for dollars, or, you know, whatever you want to do. But the point is, like in the real estate market, you got to choose a location to, to farm. Like I like the farming metaphor. You got to choose a place, and the smaller the better early on. So for me, like I was in Noonan, Georgia, when I first started looking at deals, and I would just choose a couple neighborhoods. And I, all I had was time. Like I was a you know college grad student with zero money, had a car with a little bit of gas. That's the cool thing about driving for dollars. I could go out in that little neighborhood. I could drive around, or I could get out of my car and walk around, and I could look for a few things. So number one, I would look for vacant houses. And you know that you can see that, especially in the growing seasons, you can see the grass is, is higher. You can notice that there's no blinds on the windows. You might notice there's a bunch of trash you know, around. If it's an eviction or something, somebody's evicted, uh, you know, all the stuff's on the street. You'll start seeing these signs that houses are vacant. It's, got, it's like a radar. I can drive around now being 45 miles per hour out of the corner of my eye, I can spot a vacant house. It's like, bam, there it is. Stop. And so, so as soon as you find one like that, let's say you find a vacant house or even a house that is not vacant, but all the other houses on the street are really nice and fixed up. This one just looks, you know, looks awful. It's got the roof that's 35 years old and the sh shingles are sliding off the roof. The gutters have grass, you know, plants growing in them. So anything you can see that indicates that maybe somebody's not really spending the money taking care of this property you put that on a list. You can put it on a piece of paper. You can use some kind of app uh, out there that makes it a lot easier these days just to press a button and, and start sending people mail. But the point is you could drive around in the right neighborhoods for two or three hours, find 10, 20, 30 properties that meet that, meet that criteria. And then it's just a treasure hunt from there. Then it's just how, how much do I want it? Do I want to knock on the neighbor's door and ask him the phone number of the owner? Do I want to you know, do a skip trace? And in, in these days, you can do it for like 50 cents, 25 cents, get their phone numbers. Do I send three to five letters to that owner and just keep following up, keep following up? And my, my, this is where the football linebacker came out in me. Like somebody told me that the harder it is to find the owner, the more likely that is to be a good deal. Mm -hmm. Because everybody else is going to give up on it. They're going to say, oh, I sent one letter. They didn't respond or whatever. Some of the best deals I did early in my career where, where I had to chase down where this person lived. I had to talk to a cousin who said, no, they're not in Ohio anymore. They're in Illinois. And then I have to find them where they were in Illinois. And by the time you get to that person, they're, you're like, hey, I got this house in Central South Carolina. I'd really love to buy it. Are you interested in selling? They're like, well, yes, it's in, behind on payments and foreclosure. But yeah, if you want to buy it, I'll, I'll sell it. That's bingo. Like now you got it. And, and so it takes a little bit of effort, it takes a little bit of work. But for me, is that kind of new? I had a lot of time, person, a lot of energy. I'm just willing to do it. That's the ticket. Like that's you, you want a, you want an opportunity like that where you know the Wall Street money and the big investors, they can't do that. They're not gonna go out and drive around and call people and you know beat the bushes like that. That's a competitive advantage for us as the, the small and mighty investors, which is what I like to kind of call the people I try to help is that those small investors who maybe just need a couple properties per year, maybe you're flipping one, maybe you're buying a rental, like that strategy alone, I could consistently, if you drop me in a new city, give me three months and I'll get a deal or two just with that strategy. Genius. Genius. And it works. It's a proven method that works yeah. over and over and over again. Do you have a certain type of neighborhood? Maybe you can call it a class of neighborhood, you know, if you want to break yeah. it down from A, B, C, or D that you focus on. Yeah. So just the people haven't heard of that, you probably talked about it on the show, but the distinction is like the highest price properties in town, that's A, the lowest property price properties and the ones where you might be a little, little dicey, you know, but sometimes there's some crime issues in a D neighborhood, just depends on your town. But you're going to find the most opportunities like that in the D and C neighborhoods. That's where we're going to be the most vacant properties. 
So it just depends on what your strategy is. If you were if you were wholesaling houses, which I used to do a lot, I would find deals and then get them under contract or buy them and then flip them to another investor. I would look pretty hard in the C and D neighborhoods just because there's so many properties like that. But I had to buy them really low, buy them at low prices because there's a lot of problems with the properties. They're old, they needed fixing up. And the investor, so I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say, hey, here's this property in Anderson. I used to wholesale some properties in Anderson and on the alphabet streets. And you're going to say, hey, uh, yeah, I'll pay 15 grand for that or something or 10 grand or whatever the number was. And I've got to buy it for five grand to to flip it to, to you at a price that I can make money on. So if I were wholesaling or if I was willing to manage properties in those neighborhoods, then that's a good opportunity. That's usually the lowest priced properties in town. But really my sweet spot for rental properties was in the C plus, B minus. I've kind of grown into the B properties over time. So a few A minus properties. Um, Those are harder to find. And so you might not find 10 properties in an hour. You might find one, you know, in an hour and a half. But then you start tracking that property, you start following up with it. And so it really just depends on your strategy. If you have more money, you've got more credit, you want to go up the ladder a little bit, that's cool. But, you know, if you're just starting, starting on a, a D plus, a C minus, knowing that you got to manage that, knowing you got to put some work into it if it's an older property, uh, those are good opportunities too. Just, just go where you can afford it, go where your strategy makes sense. Kudos to you for diving into the alphabet streets here in Anderson. <laughs> you guys shout out the local alphabet knowledge, right? Street. Yeah. <laughs> if you're listening, go Google the alphabet streets here in Anderson. They haven't, they haven't appreciated much uh, from the price that Chad mentioned. They're, they're pretty close to what they, <laughs> to what they were back. That was then. like, that was like 12, 15 years ago. So, all right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll probably reach, uh, you know, there's a lot of growth going on in Anderson in the upstate general. You've seen more oh, yeah. in your neck of the woods than I have because Clemson's just absolutely blown up. But there'll be a day. There'll be a day. I love away. Anderson. I mean, downtown Anderson. And, and, the, and for people who don't know the specific town, but just small towns. Like, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, like, I volunteer a lot in my small town. I just think it's an important part of our fabric of our country. You know, these little, little towns. And for investors, if you're in a big city, you're not able to find good deals. Like, look in the, I call them little satellite cities. I like start with like Atlanta or Charlotte or, you know, uh, Philadelphia. And the, those are the big economic centers. you got to have jobs. But then go to the little the little satellites outside of there, the little 20 to 50,000 person towns, you know, that have, you know, have opportunities. You know, they got little neighborhoods that are pockets that are little downtowns that are vibrant, trying to, trying to do well. You know, th- those are the places, I think, for small and mighty investors, again, where the big, the big opportunities are because we can recognize and see those little pockets opportunity that the big, huge investors, they're messing with Atlanta, they're messing with Charlotte, they're messing with big multi-units. But the little single family house, the little duplex in Anderson, South Carolina, that's not going to be on the radar of as many of those big investors. No, not at all. You can find so many good deals. And I get a lot of my students will ask me, it's too expensive where I live. Where do I invest? And we work to nail that down. But my first answer being a pain in the butt is I want you to lay a map out, grab a dart, draw, cut, draw a line down the middle of the map, aim towards the right, the bottom right. And then wherever the dart hits, go there because there are so many opportunities. There's, there's thousands upon thousands of areas where you can yeah. buy real estate. It's not just choosing one place and you hit the nail on the, on the head. I call them little micro cities. Mm. It's look at Greenville, South Carolina and go 20 minutes outside. Look at Chattanooga, South Carolina, go 20 minutes or Chattanooga, Tennessee, go 20 minutes outside Raleigh. I mean, you said you nailed it yeah. and you will find deals or you will find an area to where then you can farm yeah. and pull out deals. They're, they are all over the place, all over the place. How do you decide when you find a deal, what you're going to do with it. I think people get hung up. I think flipping has been romanticized because of TV. And so when people are new to real estate, they see, they see that and they say, oh, you have to flip to build wealth. Whereas us who've been in the game for a little bit understand, well, the real wealth is built by holding them. But there are times where it may not make sense to hold. So how do you choose what you're going to do once you find those good deals? Yeah, I think it, it depends on your personal finances. Like, so I'll go back in time with me. Like when I was just struggling to like to pay the bills and to put food on the table, like I is flipping. Like I, I flipped a house in downtown, or not downtown, right near the stadium in Clemson one time. And every time I drive by it, I'm like, man, I wish I still had that property. <laughs> Great Airbnb <Or> not, nowadays. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would, it would be, it's gone up $250,000 since the price. I had it for $130,000, $120,000, I think it was. And even at the time it was worth one fifty. dollars but I flipped it. I made you know, 12 grand on it, just to another investor. 
But and, and I kicked myself, but at the same time, I made a profit. I lived to see another day. Was a, I was 23 years old, 24 years old, and I just need to put food on the table. So, like, you if, know what they say nobody's ever gone broke making a profit. Just that's it. Write that's that exactly. Down. So, no, nobody's ever gone broke making a profit. I made a profit. So, so that, that's where you start, I think, is just understanding where you are in your personal finances. And getting and really the goal is to get yourself to a point where you don't need to flip. Like where where if you got a W two job that makes hundred grand a year, cool. Like that's great. You, you you know work on saving more money, work on paying your debt off. You know getting your personal financial stuff in order because being a rental property investor requires that. Like if you don't have good personal finances, rental properties is going to be a hot mess. You know it's going to be difficult because your your personal life is going to kind of spread into the rental properties. And I've seen this. I've seen friends and other investors over the years who. You know their, their personal finances went bad. They refinanced their, their rental properties to pay for that kind of stuff, and just that's you got to start with the personal finances so that you can then hold on to it because that's where the big wealth is made. That's where Warren Buffett made all his money, which is buying good companies, holding on to them, reinvesting all the profit, never selling. Every mm -hmm. once in a while, he'd sell it here and there, right? Um, and that's. You know, that, that, that's the way we've made, made money too. Like finally we got to the point where we didn't have to flip as much where we, we would just sell a rental here and there just to make a little bit of money. And then eventually the cash flow started paying for our lifestyle. And then my criteria changed a lot. It was more about high quality, low turnover, renters who stay as long as possible, like a single family house, for example, or I have college student rentals because I'm in, in a college town, having the ones that are the closest to campus along the bus line, high quality buildings, low maintenance. So there's a lot of things I've missed as an early investor that I didn't think were that important. I just looked at the numbers and said, lowest price possible. That's what I want. Wow. Um, it, that, it's not, that's not all what it's about. Over the long run, if you own a property, having a high maintenance property will eat you alive. You won't make the same cash flow as the same property a block away. I mean, a similar property that has all brick, low maintenance flooring, that kind of thing. So for me now, it's like the numbers plus the quality of the location plus the quality of the property, that all kind of combines, that trifecta combines for a good deal. And whereas it used to be just, let me look at the numbers, I'll figure out the rest. I think it's interesting that you bring up how your mindset shifts as you go. And that's normal. Um, that's very normal. I, by the time this comes out, I will have done a little three-day workshop that I'm hosting with folks, really helping them put together that game plan to buy their first property. And one of the hardest things that has been for me putting it together is I have been through so many transitions of where my head's at of buying real estate. Yep. But I'm having to take myself back to how do I get these folks from zero to one? Because we got to get from zero to one. That's the biggest step. Then from there, once we get our bearings and we learn more, then we can start getting creative and branching out. But to to those of you listening who may not have bought your first property, hear, hear what Chad's saying. Let's, let's stay focused. Choose those properties where the numbers make sense. Don't get cute with it. Don't put yourself in a bad scenario that's going to hurt you personally, financially. Make good buying decisions on the front end. Let that compound over time. And then you can change investment strategies and start or start bringing in different products. Chad's been doing this for what? I mean, it's twenty years now. You started in in, yeah. in two thousand and three. You're a lot farther in the game than most people. Yeah, and I, Jaren, I think a good point you just made is that your first deal. Like a mentor of mine named John Schaub, who wrote a book, Building Wealth One House at a Time. He he always makes the point that like his very first property that he bought was not a home run. Like it was a single at best. You know, like he put twenty percent down. He paid retail price for it. But the thing was, he held on to it and he learned and his knowledge compounded. And I think a lot of first time investors, when you're buying that first deal or two, you look at what Jaron's done, you look at what I've done, and maybe you look at a deal that I bought 15, 20 years after I started, and you're like, ooh, that, that's a good deal. Let me try to do that. As opposed to saying like, all right, let me just get on base. Like having not gotten on base yet, let me just get a hit. And yes, you want to protect the downside. You don't want to make, make, make big mistakes. So that's why I would say like, go a little... You know, don't make a mistake on the location. Like buy a location that is solid. We can attract good tenants, and then, but then, like the numbers, you might have to say, you know what, I'm just going to get a base hit on the numbers. I'm not going to get the best deal I've ever bought. I'm not going to buy it 30% below value. I might not get a you know 15% cash on cash return, but build buy it solid with a good location and good financing. Those are the two things that you can you know you don't want to screw up. If you get those th two things right, the rest of the time will kind of help you out if you're in a good location. And time will help you out if you lock in your financing over a long time. 
and you will learn so much. Like your knowledge will compound and compound and compound even more than your bank account because mm. you'll you'll learn a ton with those first couple of deals. That's genius, man. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. It probably took me six or seven deals before I hit anything other than a single on a deal. They were just yeah. decent, solid deals, and I still have them all in my portfolio today. And now I look back, I'm like, man, those those turned out to to actually be like doubles now. It wasn't just a single. Yeah. We're talking baseball terms. It wasn't just single. Yeah, now it's kind of a double on its way. It's rounding second on its way to third because that's what time yeah. in the market does for you. So it's amazing. Absolutely. When you're analyzing properties, once you found them, what are what are key metrics that you're looking for? Now, I personally don't put myself in a box. Maybe you do. So if you do, I want you to be completely honest, share how you do it. I don't say, hey, I have to have this much cash flow. Every deal has to be exactly this percent cash on cash return. Um, but I'd love love for you to share with the listeners kind of what's your key metrics you're looking for. Yeah, like l- long run, if I, if I zoomed way out, I, like, I do want to have a, a kind of a ret- base return that I'm looking for. Like, l- let's just, let's throw a number out. Like if, if I had a very, very low risk deal, like if I paid all cash for it, had no debt on it, total 10% return would be kind of a kind of a base base look for me but that that's not just cash flow that's like all right well if i paid cash for it let's just keep this really simple if i could get a 7% you know cash return by paying like i paid 150,000 for a property i got a 7% cash on cash return because i just paid paid cash for it and maybe i would expect that area potentially to have 3% appreciation in my area that would give me a total of about 10% like 7% from cash flow 3% from growth. Like that would be a, a kind of a starting point. That's a really simple analysis because I don't have any debt on the property. Um, but if I were to start adding debt onto the property and which is always, you're taking a little bit more risk, but I think taking some risk with debt's fine, especially if it's longer term debt and good fixed interest debt, you know, I might look for more like a 15 to 20% total return. You know, it's kind of going up the scale. And I, I look at that, I use like an internal, internal rate of return. That's kind of the ultimate, mm-hmm. um, you know, w- way I analyze a deal. It's a little more complicated because you got to get a spreadsheet out. You got to run some numbers. But the, the cool thing is you can, you can kind of approximate those types of returns by like, for example, if you're looking at a, a rental property and you know your location, like in our location, it's mainly cash flow with a little bit of growth. If I were in a high growth area where, you know, if I paid cash for a property, I could only get like a 3% or a 4% cash return. That's called a cap rate or an unleveraged yield. Then I might have to anticipate that I'm going to get more growth. Like, so if I'm, if I'm buying in a high growth, high growth area and I better get like a five to six, 7% growth rate in order to compete with my Clemson, South Carolina, you know, 10% return. Like I've, I've really got to make up for it on the growth. And so that's the game you got to play in a high price price market. And some people are okay with that. Like, that's fine. You can go out and get debt on that, that more expensive property. Like I, I find the cash flow markets a little bit more intuitive. Like I think people get that. Like you can use the cash flow to pay for your debt. You can use it to, um, you know, debt snowball and pay the thing off over time. So like I, I feel more comfortable in those, those more balanced cash flow growth markets. But overall, it really just comes down to like what return metrics make sense for you. There's different ways to get it. There's cash flow, there's growth, there's using a little bit of leverage here and there, but that's really it. Like that is, if you're not making cash flow, you're not getting growth somewhere. I don't know of any other levers other than maybe tax benefits, which I kind of count as a that's bonus. A different ball game. Yeah. That's, just, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the gravy. It's kind of the icing on the cake, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, tax benefits can change. So to me, it's cash flow and then some kind of growth estimate. And if those two don't meet my number, then pass. I'll move, move on or I'll make a lower price and then m- lower offer, then move on to another deal. I love that. I, I think one of the things I did when I first started was I was not factoring in growth. And so I was so green, which, you know, it's fine. It, 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 you won't necessarily hurt yourself Mm-mm. by doing that, by factoring in future growth, but you don't really realize the opportunity that lies before you. And so my first couple of deals, I was just looking at year one pro formas, not even thinking, what does this property look like three, five, seven years from now? Well, you know, a couple of years into the game, you start seeing the benefits of what time does and what that growth does and the cash flow growing or because rents are going up and you start saying, oh, I probably need to factor these these numbers into my pro forma for future, um, you know, metrics to know what this return is going to look like down the road. And it is it has helped me make better decisions on properties um, that that I may 
not have pursued as hard um, originally, but then, you know, as you, as you progress and you become more of a seasoned veteran, it opens up opportunities and allows you to make good buying decisions. So I'd encourage y'all, just like Chad said, make sure you're looking at those growth numbers as well. Yeah. And I made the same decisions you did. I mean, it's cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. And I think that's okay. Like for me, it was early on, but I did miss on some opportunities because I think it's hard to like anticipate and it still is when that growth is going to happen. So like if yeah. you have a long time horizon, so if you say, all right, I'm going to hold this property for 10 years, see what happens, right? Then you can start saying, all right, well, I'm just going to hold it till it doubles in growth or I'm going to hold it till it gets from 200,000 to 400,000 or, you know, something like that. Th- then growth, make, that makes more sense over the long run. But I, the thing I think people, myself included, would get into trouble doing is saying, all right, this year, every year is going to go up by 3%. Well, no, it's not. It's going to go flat for three years and it might go down five or 10% and then it might go up 20%. And, you know, that's, that's the way growth works. But if you buy a, if you buy good locations, going back to our farming metaphor, like that rich soil is what really mm. benefits you. Like if you can start with that qualitative analysis of saying, this is a, a good economy, this is a place where people are moving into, and then I'm going to go buy cash flow in that good rich soil. Over time, that rich soil is going to, is going to kind of, help you out. You're going to grow. It's going to, your tree, your plants are going to grow because the soil of the rich market, that's what produces the growth. It's just hard to anticipate when and how. I don't think anybody's smart enough to know exactly how that's going to work, but man, you do make, I've been amazed how much money you can make in growth. And I, I, I totally discounted it as well early on. I love the analogy of rich soil. I've not heard that one. That is, that is good. I'm going to have to borrow it. I'll give you credit for it. Yeah, for it's sure. all good. I, I probably, I, I borrowed it from somebody else. So we'll keep it going. <laughs> and, and to the listeners, you're hearing this from somebody who's been doing this 20 years. So you can't throw the label on Chad. Oh, well, we've had a, a, a hot last couple of years. We have, but he started in 2003. So he yeah. went through the 08, 09, you know, 2010 nonsense. He's been- By the skin of my teeth, hold, holding on for dear life as well. <laughs> was that a quick one minute like excerpt on that? What was that like being a real estate investor then? Yeah, I mean, we, we did everything stupid. We, 2007, we had 33 acquisition closings. A lot of those are flips, some are rentals. We had way too many properties. We grew too fast. We had negative cash flow on a few. We did more good than bad, but- the, the best thing we did was save a ton of our money and live frugally so that we had a big pile of cash going into the storm. And then we needed that cash and it started going down and down and down. And I uh, had a year or two there where we didn't make a lot of money. We were feeding our rental properties and until we finally figured it out and kind of got back on our feet. Um, but we survived. Like I had friends who went out of business and they're out forever, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think the the opportunity, the, the lesson from that for me is that is that you need to be prepared for a lot of things. This goes back to like my linebacker metaphor. When I played middle linebacker, like I always had my head on a swivel. Like I knew some big 350 pound dude was about to like smack me in the side of the head. And that's really the way the economy is. Like you, you just can't predict what's going to happen. And so having liquidity, having cash, Ooh, um, making decisions like having long term mortgages without balloons so that you can like fix, you know, it's almost like insurance. Like you just, you, it's a little more expensive to buy insurance, but you want to do the smart financial moves that seem conservative at the time but you're preparing for the storm. You're getting ready for the rainy day. The worst case scenario is you paid a little bit too much. You set too much money aside and you couldn't reinvest that money. Like, so what? But you were able to survive the, the 2008, 2009 financial storm. That's what, that's what got us through it. That and relationships with people, you know, private lenders. We had a couple of private lenders who we all kind of circled the wagons and said, hey, we're in this together. Let's do this. And um, that, that got us through. Wow. Liquidity is important. The real, you know, real estate game, we talk a lot about leverage because it is is very powerful and used correctly. And we'll talk about funding here in a second. Used correctly, it, it it's an unbelievable tool. But there is nothing wrong with having some cash on hand. Just like Chad said, it is that insurance. It's that safety net that is there for rainy days, and we don't ever think they're coming. That's the that's the scary part. But when they're mm-hmm. when they do show up, you want to be prepared. So talking about good uh, debt. You know, you mentioned that having good, good types of mortgages you've done what well, you got over a hundred units. You've done who knows how many deals. So I'm sure you got a, a lot of experience with lots of different types of financing. How have you made, been able to build your portfolio over time, you, you know, as it relates to finance or financing and debt? Yeah, I've actually been working on like collecting my thoughts on this. I put, I've, I've been writing down like some safe debt rules that I've, mm-hmm. I've some of them I followed consciously 
some of the, I, I followed more just like, you know, accidentally. <laughs> and, um, but, but some of the, some of those, we just mentioned having cash reserves that has, that's not the money directly, but like having cash reserves is a big part of my financing strategy and actually having, and if you, if you talk to most bankers, they like to see that you have cash reserves. So that, that makes sense, right? That's, that's a good, smart thing to do. Um, the other part of it for me, like my own experience is a little different maybe than, than everybody else's will be. If, if you have a full-time job, good credit, good income, you can go out and get conventional financing. Like that's, that's great. If you get as much as you can get, because that's 30 year fixed financing at the lowest interest rates you can get. I didn't do that though, because I was an entrepreneur from the time I got out of college. I got one owner, a conventional loan on a, on, a, on a fourplex that I lived in. That's all I got. Like that, because if you don't have a job, if you're an entrepreneur, especially a new entrepreneur, you're just not real bankable. You're not, you're not a great loan. <clears throat> so if you can get those loans, great. But I didn't. And so I went more the unconventional route. I used a lot of seller financing. I used a lot of private money. That was the number one source of money I got. So I had to build relationships with local investors, typically investors who were a lot further along than me, who had capital, but were kind of ambitiously lazy. They're like, eh, I don't want to do all that stuff, that work that Chad's doing now, um, I, but I'll put my money with you. And so it started off, we do some partnerships. Eventually, though, we started just doing nice, simple little private loans where, hey, I'm going to flip this house. Can I pay you 10% interest? And then when I sell it in three months, four months, I'll pay you the interest. Or we eventually, after 2008 and nine, when we had to start high, buying more rental properties, uh, we pay them 6% interest. And we would just hold the property, pay them interest. They got passive income from us. Often this was in their retirement account. So they used like a self-directed retirement account. And I would teach them how to do this. These would be pretty savvy investors who are like, really? I can take 150,000 bucks for my 401k that I used to have at a job and move it to a custodian that lets me loan it to you? I was like, yeah, I'll help you do it if you want to do it. <laughs> and so I, I, I racked up like hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans from these people's private, uh, from their self-directed retirement accounts. And they they have been so thankful over the years. These have been mentors and friends, but I would thank them. I'd say, yeah, you got me through those early years. I really appreciate it. And But I would pay, I paid them off, a lot of them off a few years ago. And they're like, you, were, you helped me pay my groceries. Like, this was great. Like the, your interest on these loans was amazing. So it, it's just such, such a feel good uh, type of way of doing business is doing these private loans. And it, that's, it was sort of an accident for me because I had to do it, but it turned into my, my number one way of buying properties and holding them as well. That's great. You, you mentioned they came to you and said, thank you so much for allowing us to lend to you. So many times when we're going to ask for money, I know when I first started, you almost feel like a beggar. Yes. That you're bothering somebody, but you have to get to that mindset that this is a win-win for both. This is a business transaction. You're not the only one benefiting. You feel like you are, but they're benefiting so much and it's very passive. They're doing a lot less work than you are and they have a lot less risk. So yes. when you are going to have those conversations with private lenders, feel confident. You know, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not a beggar. And if it's a good deal for both of you, um, it, it's a win-win situation and, and everybody's going to walk away happy. What tips do you have for somebody looking for a private lender? I, that's a question I get a lot. How do, I don't know how to find a private lender. I think that there's a, let me give you a practical tip and then I'll give you kind of the philosophical part as well, the kind of attitude you need to have. Um, from a practical standpoint, you just need to practice your little elevator pitch of talking about what you do. So, I mean, in the age of social media, this is like brilliant. Like you, you can just share to your friends and your, your audience, like, Tell stories, like tell them what you're doing. Hey, I'm out driving for dollars today. Like, look at me, look at this property. I hope I can buy that one. And, and when people start asking questions, like, how are you going to buy one, Chad? Like, you, can, you don't have any money. Like, how are you going to buy it? And then that's an opening, right? Like, well, actually, I use private lenders. Like, I have somebody who, you know, let, let me, can I draw it out for you? Like, this is what I do on my YouTube channel a lot. I draw out on a little whiteboard. And, and that, that's the same thing I do on YouTube. I've been teaching to my private lenders and people over the years. They would say, well, how do I do that, Chad? And I get the little stick man with the, you know, the house and the, another stick person with the, you know, the money. And I say, Here, all right, you got the money. I got the house. I'm going to buy it. It's a $150,000 house. I'm going to buy it for 100000 bucks." You put up the hundred thousand dollars. I pay you six percent interest, and it's just like the bank. You know, if if I die, if I get run over by a bus, I hope you go to my funeral. I hope you cry, but when you leave, <laughs> I hope you're happy that you had this house that's worth one hundred fifty thousand bucks, and you only have a hundred thousand dollar loan against it. So, worst case scenario, you could take this property back. You got a real asset, 
And so people, the, the people whose eyes light up when you talked about that, that's, that's who gets it. They get real estate. They like tangible assets. They don't want a piece of paper on something that they don't really get and they don't really understand. Like there's somebody who wants to see, they want to drive by it and they probably will. They'll drive by it. Okay. House is still there. Good. Chad's still making my payments. Good. Um, <laughs> you, you'll find that that's, if you, if you tell 10 people that story, you go to real estate meetups, if you go on social media, you know, just tell your story over and over and over again and practice that then the right people will kind of bubble up. The people you already know in your world or the people you meet at the real estate meetups, you'll find the right people. But most people, myself included, were afraid to tell my story. Like we're afraid mm -hmm. to put ourselves out there. You, you got to tell people that they're not going to, they're not just going to land in your lap. Like you've got to, you got to market yourself. You got to be a personal brand. You got to be like the finance cowboy. You know, you, you got to like get, get your, uh, get your neon uh, sign in the background and, and, and like let people know who, what you're all about, because that's, that's the way it works these days. Like it's, it's always been personal branding, but mm -hmm. now you've got to, you got to tell your story. So that's the practical part of it. Mm -hmm. um, the philosophical part of it is you've got to actually take care of your investors. Like the, the this is a, uh, a quote, I think one of my, my private investors told me early on from Zig Ziglar, he said, Chad, if you make enough, if you make enough money for other people, I'm not quoting it right. You'll make, you, you'll make just unlimited amounts of money. Mm -hmm. Like you just take care of me, take care of your private lenders. And I really took that to heart. I was like, all right, I got one job, like make my private lender safe, make my private lender a bunch of money. In 2008 and 2009, when I had my private lenders, I would rather die than have them not get their money. Like that's the attitude I took. And they felt it. They knew it. They knew like this guy is for real. He will do whatever it takes. He'll, you know, he's going to take care of me first. And when that attitude comes through, that's, that's not normal, right? A lot mm. of people, everybody else is kind of like, eh, well, you owe me money or, you know, whatever. Like it's kind of the opposite of the, the normal thing. And so when you get private lenders who can sense that about you, they'll, they'll know you're for real. They trust you. Trust is the glue that holds everything together, every business deal, every relationship. Every, the society, you know. Yeah. Um, so if you if you can build trust with people and let them feel that, then that's the kind of philosophical part that makes you successful over the long run. You get repeat business. You get them referring friends to you. Like after I got a few private lenders, I didn't have to go advertise. It was just like so and so tells so and so. I've got yep. a waiting list. That's it. I always say just get that one. There's seven billion people on planet Earth. Three hundred and almost fifty million in the U.S. Just get yeah. one. If you yep. get one and do all the things you just said, be honest, treat them right, get them their money back. I've even paid them. I'm not saying go out and do this every time. I've even given like an extra little love back. The first couple I ever did, I owed yep. them whatever, 5,000. I've gave them 5,500 and said, thank you yep. so much. You allowed me to get this deal done. Just go the extra mile, do whatever you have to do to pay them back. And the floodgates will open. And it's like you say, you got a wait list. I have deals now where people are asking me to lend to them. And I get to choose. It went from me having to find them to now I get to choose who I want to work with. And it, that happens by you finding good deals and doing the right thing to your private investors. Chad, that's awesome. You got a book coming out, The Small and Mighty Real Estate Investor, uh, sometime this summer, probably around July. I am super stoked about it. I can't wait to read it. Um, what's what, what can we look forward to in this book? Yeah, so it's it's sort of a guidebook, but the the, the people it's a guidebook for are those small investors. And mm -hmm. it, this is I'll get on my high horse for a little for a minute here. Um, you know, going big's great. Like you know, you, you gotta. There's people out there who want a 10x, and there's people out there who want to you know go take over the world and have thousands of units. And like I, I, I'm not mad at them. Like that's that's cool. Like do your do your thing. The thing I don't like though is that is that if if you if you have dreams, if you have aspirations, like we talked about earlier telling people you got to go big in order to reach those dreams is actually a little dishonest because actually the simplest way is often the best way to get to your goals. Like the, you know, the, the kind of the definition of a small and mighty investor is having the least number of properties, having the least number of investments you need to accomplish whatever your goals are. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, it's like a more elegant solution to the problem. It's the, it's the more efficient, simple solution. And what, what does that do practically? Well, of course, you got to have the money you need to, to pay for your bills, but it also reduces the amount of things you're thinking about. It removes, it reduces the amount of moving parts. It's just simpler to run. It's easier to run it. And I like kind of the aspiration for me when I wrote this book, and I've had lots and lots of people who, who listen to my podcast and I talk to and lots of students over the years. Like that's, I wrote the book for them to say, all right, 
first and foremost, that's the goal. Have a small, and mighty business. Here's how you, but then show them like here. This here's how you do it. Here's, here, you have to do things a little differently. You're, if you're not going to try to have a thousand units, like maybe eventually you'll kind of grow, 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 and you start paying some of your debt off. Like maybe you actually want to to get out of debt after you've grown because that keeps things simpler instead of using that extra money to always keep growing. Maybe you have more cash flow and less risk and have a little simple portfolio of five properties or 10 properties. So it just depends on your goals. But I think putting that as the aspiration and having quality of life, simplicity, having a portfolio that supports you and kind of doesn't run your life like you run your portfolio, you run yeah. your business because the bigger you get, I compare it to like a, a Frankenstein monster. You know, like that story of Frankenstein is a horror story. Like, the scientist was brilliant. He said, this is going to be an amazing creature. I'm going to make it. And the lightning struck and all that stuff. And the thing woke up and it was this horrible, huge, monstrous thing. Mm. Like that's entrepreneurs. Like that's what happens to 90% of the people who go big. They, they think it's exciting. And then the monster starts eating all their time and it starts eating all their, uh, all their free time and flexibility. Like I've been there. Like I, I did that for a little while in 2007. And I said, no, no, no. Like that's not my business style. I'm going to I want to keep it small, you know, and for me, I have a business partner. So half of, you know, 110, 100, 101 units, you know, is about 50 units. Some of those are, you know, multi-unit properties. So I'm big enough, like I don't need any more properties. And so for the last five, six years, it's been about paying them off, simplifying life. And so the book was really just kind of sharing the, both the journey of how to do that. And then the, the X's and O's, the financing, the acquisitions, the property management, the due diligence, like all those kind of meat and potato kind of things that are necessary to buy finance and run a portfolio like that, that doesn't take all your time. Like I, I spend about two hours per week on my real estate these days, you know, some weeks are more, some weeks are less, but that's a real number. Like that's, that's me paying a full-time income with a very, very part-time uh, amount of time I spend on the real estate. So that for me, that's the kind of aspiration I want to hold up there to people. It's like, what would you do if you had the rest of your week and you only had two hours to make all your money. Like, what would you do? What would you do with your time? That's, uh -oh. that's, that's the way it can be. Wow. This book is going to be powerful. I can't wait. I, I honestly cannot wait because I, I have the same aspirations as you. I, I don't need everything. It's what can get me to freedom. What is the, the simplest form to get me to where I want to go? But you said you experienced in 2007, everybody being human. I think we, we set our goals and we have blinders on for a second and then we lose them because there's all these flashy objects and opportunities. And like you said, the next thing, you know, this monster's born and you're miserable and you're having panic attacks and your health's not good. And you're like, what is this? You don't enjoy every day. And so the fact that you, this book's going to be out in the world to remind folks, Hey, you know, obviously the X's and O's, but more so the mindset of what do you want? Once you decide on that, put that plan together, keep those blinders on and go get it. Don't, don't get, don't get uh, distracted by things that, that are going to take you away because, um, you know, there's a reason you chose that goal in the first place. There's a reason you chose that goal in the first place. Well, Chad, thank you so much for being on here. This was absolutely amazing. I, uh, I was late to this podcast for everybody listening. I thought it started at 11, started at 10 30. Chad's like, bro, where you at? Get on here. So he was nice enough to nice enough to wait on me. But if you, if you stuck around and you listen to this episode, take a screenshot of you listening and, uh, post it on your story on Instagram and tag me at finance cowboy tag Chad at coach Carson one. We both would love to thank you personally for taking time out of your day to listen to this. I know it was super helpful. Chad, I want to thank you so much for being on this episode. This was amazing, man. And uh, we'd love to have you back anytime. Yeah, let's let me know. Thank you, Jaron. It's a pleasure being here. Great talking to you. And thanks for the work you're doing as well. Can't wait to talk awesome. again. Everybody go get Chad's book this July, this July, The Small and Mighty Real Estate Investor. Talk soon.